right, Pearlside Church, how you doing? Good morning, and for those who are joining us online, hello to you. It is so great to be with you this morning, and uh, as we mentioned, Pastor Jim LaFoon, he says this is one of the greatest churches uh, in, on the planet, so thank God for all of you, and uh, I know you know he's uh, an, a major encourager, but we also are very encouraged by your leadership here. Aren't you grateful for Pastor Billy and Naomi, uh, all of the pastors here, Pastor Paris, Pastor Russell? We appreciate all of them. And so I wanted to uh, give my wife a moment here to greet all of you. Uh, she'll be speaking tonight at the service um, later on. So why don't you give your greeting? All right. Aloha, everyone. It's so good to be here, an honor and a privilege, truly. You've heard so many things, so many amazing things, just as Reggie has shared, and to be here in front of you is not just an exciting treat. It's just like a moment in time where I need to write it in my journal and just say, God, thank you for that awesome privilege. So as he, as Reggie's just getting ready to share the word, I just want to tell you all that, you know, your reputation precedes you and it's because of your commitment to the Lord and your heart to serve. And I pray that even as you have shown hospitality to us and loved on us, that God will bless you as a church and even as individuals, that God will bless you this week, that there will be pleasant surprises in places you didn't even expect in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. We love you. Awesome. Appreciate you. Well, we are actually not here by ourselves uh, for the first time uh, on this island. We had a chance to bring our children with us. And so here's a, a picture of our family. Uh, they will be joining us in the next service here. And so you'll see the the, the tall one um, on the right of my wife, he is uh, Nicholas, and he is actually officially past me in height this year. So he is the tallest one in the house, um, and I don't know if that has gone to his head or not yet, but uh, he is. And then there's the second one, um, David. He is full of energy uh, and life, and he's never met a stranger before. He'll talk to anybody. Uh, and then... Uh, there's my, my daughter who is like her mama, is a firecracker, loves to sing uh, and, and to speak and to get, raise her voice at times. And so those of you that will be coming, uh, those will be joining at the uh, later service today, will get a chance to experience that through my wife. And so grateful to be here uh, together and to be able to share this morning with you and continue in our series, this particular series on resilience. I'm happy to just jump into it. Uh, and I had a chance last week uh, through online to hear Billy, Pastor Billy, speak on uh, Elijah, the life of Elijah, and how we need to be uh, resilient and how we can be resilient, especially in the midst of a culture where the currents would try to pull us away from really standing for Jesus and standing for the truth. And so there are things that need to take place in our lives so that we can stand for what may be increasing currents in our culture that would try to pull us away. And he spoke of how we can look into the life of Elijah and see how he was able to be resilient during a very difficult time in Israel's history. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that this morning, but what intrigued me about this particular topic of resiliency had to do with the very name of Elijah. Uh, his name, Elijah, Eli, means his, God, and Jah means Yahweh. And so the very mission of Elijah is hidden in his name. It's to show people that God is Yahweh and that his God is bigger and better than any idols out there, than any other things that would be worshipped. And all of the gods that were worshipped by the, the people at that particular time, it was to show that he was bigger and better and greater. Yahweh is the self-existent God. He's the creator God. He's the God that's all-knowing, all-powerful, that's eternal, that's all-present, that's all-feeling. And there's no one like this God, Yahweh. And Elijah was to put him on display to the world. And that 
was the purpose and essence of his resiliency. And being resilient, he would do that. Now, the question that I want to ask us this morning is, is because Elijah was to put God on display, did that mean that everything in his life was just going to be all rosy and it was going to be perfect without any challenges? And I think you know the answer to that. But if we're going to put God on display and show the world that Yahweh is God, that he is our God, it does not mean that we won't face challenges. In fact, the challenges and the difficulties that we face will actually show that he is God because we're able to overcome them. In fact, the darkness, in the darkness, we can see the light shine the brightest. When there's challenges that we're facing, we can actually see God come through with his power, his provision, his protection, even in moments where maybe what we considered previously comfortable Previously, the norm in our lives is no longer there, but there's a change that takes place. But it's through that change that God's able to display his greatness in and through us. And this is what we see through the life of Elijah. I want us to take a moment to read in 1 Kings 17, verses 7 through 16. You can read along with me if you have your Bible or you can pull it up on your phone. It says here in verse 7 that sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So I'm picking up right where Pastor Billy left off. Elijah's being fed by ravens. He's, he has a water brook that he's able to drink from, and now it's dried up. And verse 8 says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath when he came to the town gate. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Oh my. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. This is the word of the Lord. Help us to receive it into our hearts. Let it be branded in our very souls. And Lord, help us to live this word out. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, sometimes in our lives, the brook dries up. The ravens stop feeding us. There's some particular resource or something that happens that's brought to an end. And what we see in this particular passage is that although that resource is brought to an end, it is not the end of our lives. It is not the end of God's purpose in our lives. In fact, God wants to bring more provision to us, and he wants to provide for us. But it's not just for him to provide for us, but it's also for him to use us to provide for other people. God wants to provide through us. And this is what you see in this particular passage with the prophet Elijah and the widow. And there are three things I want to highlight that will help us to be resilient 
when we meet this season of change. How many of you have gone through a season of change? How many of you are going through a season of change? Where something needs to pivot, something needs to shift. And so here are some things that we see in this story will help us. The first thing is that we can be resilient as we receive God's instruction. We can be resilient as we receive God's instruction. When God wants us to pivot and things are starting to shift in our lives, it can signal to us, hey, we need to listen to the divine instruction that God wants to give us. And this is what we see in this particular story because God is going to use an unlikely person to do an unlikely thing that produces an unlikely result. And he's going to do that as he speaks his divine instruction to us. See, that when, we, when we're facing the challenges that we have in our lives, the very first thing we need to do is to listen to where God wants to lead us next. What is it that God wants us to do? Because God has a plan for us. And these divine instructions that we specifically are talking about is us listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and heeding or reading the Word of God. As we get into the Word and as we listen to the Holy Spirit, then we can hear where God is leading us. See, the problem is, is that we have to be attentive to what he's saying. I mean, we get so distracted very quickly. I mean, we're off thinking about the, the next thing we need to do. We're out thinking about what we're going to post on the Instagram or what, you know, what's the next Netflix or Disney Plus thing we're going to look at. And we're thinking about all these particular things, and, and they're going through our minds instead of listening to God. Some of us are, are thinking about, uh, we're, we're listening to other things like the, the next newest kind of popular ideology that we get on YouTube or social media. Or we're thinking about political agendas. Or maybe there's some other thing, some well-meaning person that doesn't really know God that we're listening to. And we're listening to them and what it does is it's distracting us from hearing what God wants us to hear in the moment so that we can make the necessary shift that God wants us to make. We need to lean into him. Now, some of us, what's happened is that we're, maybe it's not any of those things. We're just stuck on the fact that we used to have a brook that had water in it. And we had ravens feeding us. And we're looking at what we used to have and the pain of that thing gets us stuck and focused on it as opposed to listening to what God has for us in the future. To so some of us, we need to turn our attention from, from what we used to have into what God wants to bring us. And this is what we see in this particular story. God has instructions for us, things he wants to bring us, a way he wants us to pivot based on the divine word that he's going to give us. It reminds me of a good friend of mine that I had a chance to, to, to disciple and mentor as a college student. And this was at Duke University. He played football. His name was Vinny. And uh, Vinny would oftentimes sit with us, and this is a picture of him here and playing for the Cincinnati Bengals. He ended up graduating from Duke, moving from football as a college student into the NFL. And I told him as a student, I said, Vinny, listen, when you are an ex-athlete, there is nothing more irrelevant than an ex-athlete. Now, if you're an ex-athlete, I'm sorry. But it's the truth. People forget about you. It's like, who was that? Who is this? You know, there's always the newest guy that comes up. And I said, you have to figure out what God wants to happen in your life. And so he was reaching the end of his career and he knew it's over with. All of his friends are groping for what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And what did Vinny do? He decided, I'm going to pray and ask God and receive divine instruction from God on what it is I need to do. And God spoke to him. And he said, you, should, you need to continue in the realm of athletics, but not like you've been. So he spoke to him about being a chaplain. So Vinny came on the team and became a chaplain. And now he's also a chaplain with the, the college, colleges in the area. And not only that, but he's actually mentoring others. 
And so because of divine instruction, Vinny was able to see not only the provision that God had made for him in terms of his purpose and his direction, but he also became one who would bring purpose and direction to others by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And see, this is what God wants. God wants us to sit back and say, God, what are you doing? Where are you leading me in my life? We're to receive divine instruction. And sometimes it can come in packages that we are, that just don't look like what we think they should look like. See, if we're looking for like, oh, God, you did a miracle like this before, so maybe you'll do something like this again. Maybe he will, but other, many times he doesn't. He's not a boring God. Sometimes he operates in a way that is, blows our mind as beyond what we can think. And that brings me to this next particular point, which is we can be resilient when we follow God's plan. See, the, the, God's plan may not look like what we want it to look like. I mean, it's, it may, for, for Elijah, it involved the widow. He says, go to this widow in Zarephath. And that's where your provision is. Okay, now, when we read this story, we already know the end of it. God's going to provide. But you got to think about how Elijah felt when he was in the middle of it. Okay, the brook has dried up. Man, I'm getting fed by ravens. This is a great time, God. Okay, now go to a widow. Wait a minute. Widow. Widows don't have a lot of money. Not in this society because what happened was that the man or the sons were the ones that actually brought in the income. They could only live a little bit off of the land. And so you're sending me to a widow that doesn't have a lot of money to provide for me? Not only that, you're telling me to go to Zarephath. Zarephath was in the region of Sidon. There was a person that was pursuing Elijah, that was an enemy of Elijah, a wicked king, Ahab, and his wife, Jezebel, who, were, who was also wicked, that worshiped false gods. And guess where she was from? Sidon, near Zarephath. Eight miles away. So wait a minute. You're sending me to a widow to the enemy's place? And wait a minute. This widow doesn't worship Yahweh. She's a Gentile. And she too is experiencing a drought. This is crazy. How is it that I'm going to find provision in that place? Doesn't seem Right. Here's, here's what you see about God is that, that, that sometimes he gives us this divine instruction. It isn't always what we would expect it to be. It may be something different than what we actually think should happen. It's like, wait a minute, don't send me to a widow. Send me to a palace. But see, that's not where God wanted him to go. Because God was going to do something to show that Yahweh is his God. Elijah. And so he sends Elijah to this particular woman. And it didn't make sense. But God was saying, Elijah, will you follow my plan? See, that when we say, I'm going to follow the plan of God, I'm going to follow God. That makes us resilient, regardless of whether it makes sense or not, regardless of not, whether or not it's a challenging situation. We say, God, I've received your divine instruction. Now I'm going to follow you. We become resilient. You know, it reminds me of a time when the Lord told me something that just did not make sense. He's, I was a college student after my freshman year needing resources, needing money. I didn't have money for books, didn't have money for clothes, didn't have a car. And I needed every single one of those things. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to just read the Bible. Read the Bible and pray. Do not get a job. And I was, one week went by, I was successful at it. I did it again. I did it a month went by. And then it was within two weeks of going to school and I did it. And I didn't have any money. So I was like, God, what am I going to do? I have no money. I don't have clothes, books. I don't have a car. What's going to happen here? And so I got anxious. 
And I was like, I just need to go out and do something. I need to make even a little money so I can at least have books. And so I went out and I decided to get a job. And it, I was giving away these things called yellow pages. Anybody know what that is? A, we don't have that anymore. It's the yellow pages. And uh, I'm giving out these big old books in the hot, humid summer of North Carolina, putting them on one house after another, and it was miserable. And I, after, listen, I lasted every bit of two days, and that was it. I was done. I was like, I'm done. I'm going to go look for another job. So I leveled up. I went to a department store with selling women's shoes. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Having to restock and stock and put this. I was like, after a couple days there, I was done. I was like, I should not have done this. And I was talking to God. I was like, God, I, I, I have almost no money. What's going to happen? Well, literally, after I quit, a day later, my grandmother called me and said that she had clothes for me. She was giving me a car and she gave me money. She said, I don't know why, but I feel like I should give you some money. <laughs> so she gave me enough money for my books. Every single thing was need was met. Everything. And I was asking God, what was that all about? Read the Bible. Don't work a job. He said, one day, you're going to be a minister. I want you to know the Bible so that you can help feed other people. See, God brought provision in my life. I needed to follow his instruction, even though I didn't follow it perfectly. God still blessed me. So we need to follow God. God leads us into a place of provision. As we follow him, a place where not only we can provide for us, we're provided for ourselves, but we can also be a blessing to other people. For Elijah, it wasn't just that moment of provision for himself, getting the cakes and the, the water. And, but it was also God's heart for the woman, for the widow. Could it be that God was thinking, hey, you know what? This woman who is marginalized, this woman who seems unlikely, this is precisely the woman I would like to reach. I would like to show that I am God. Could it be that he was sent to this region of his enemy, Zarephath, so that God's glory would shine in a dark place. Could it be that when God shifts the seasons in our lives, that maybe he's sending us to show his glory to a people who don't know him? See, God cares about those that don't know him. The people that you know in the grocery stores the people you see in the restaurants that you frequent, the people in your schools and in your jobs, people in your neighborhoods, he cares about them. Sending you to them, allowing you to pivot in your life so that you can be a blessing as well to them. We see this through Elijah. It's not always ideal situation and circumstance, is it? It definitely wasn't for Elijah. Everything was stacked up against him, but yet in this situation that was not ideal, God still moved and provided for him and others. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul, how he's able to plant a church in Galatia. In fact, in Galatians 4.13, he says, It was because of my sickness and my illness that I was able to preach the gospel to you. It wasn't an ideal situation at all. But God used this moment in my life to allow me to be a blessing to a whole region. How will God use your seasonal change to bless others? See, we need to follow the plan that God has for us because in it is a blessing for us and the people that God's called us to reach. Reminds me when I read this story and I think about how Elijah 
just so boldly says, hey, lady, give me some water and give me some bread. She's like, I ain't got no more bread. Just enough for me and my son. Well, give me, give it to me first. How many of you would give it to Elijah? <laughs> like, no way, Jose. I'm not giving you this bread and water. I, we got to eat this and die. He, he asked for it first. Now, the lady has to follow the plan of God. And, and, and she does so. But what it reminds me of, it's kind of like the, 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 the tithe. Where God says, hey, listen, prioritize me in your giving first. Give me the first and the best, and then I'll bless you. This is how the kingdom works. Because when we operate like that, we're operating in faith. And what we're saying is that I believe that there is an invisible kingdom that rules over the physical kingdom that I can see with my eyes. And when I am worshiping that king, and I am giving to and, work and sacrificing for that king, it impacts the kingdom that I see around me. And this is what happens. She gives first to him, to the messenger of God, and then God blesses her in her family. That's how it works also in the principle with the giving of the tithe. And so God gives divine instruction to them. They both follow God's plan, and then it leads to this incredible provision. And that brings me to my last point here is we can be resilient as we trust that God will provide for us. You know what's interesting is that the false gods that were worshipped during this particular time in this region of Zarephath and Sidon was, was Baal. Baal was the, the, the god of the storm and rain, and, and, and it was a warrior. He's also oftentimes depicted as a, a god with a, with, with a lightning bolt in his hand. And they, people worship him because they believed that he would bring protection, but also that he would fertilize their crops and also bring fertility to the women so that they could be, be pregnant and have kids. And so Baal was all about prosperity. That's really what it was about. I'm going to prosper in my life and in my finances. Very interesting. So a lot of people were putting their trust in Baal for material prosperity. And I find a very important application here for us is that they were worshiping Baal and not worshiping Yahweh. And for us, we have to be very careful not to put our trust in money and to worship money instead of worshiping Yahweh. See, this is what led them astray. It's because they were looking for some other way to get their needs met, to find their own comfort, to find their approval, to find power other than Yahweh. And when we look into these particular things in our society, they can draw us away into false worship of another God. In fact, I, I, I love what Tim Keller says about this. He says that these, the particular thing, what money really gives us are these things, and it, it, it gives us this worldly power, approval, comfort, control. It's our meta idols that hold sway over our daily lives. These are the things that, that, that penetrate our lives. If we're not careful, they will keep us from being resilient. They'll pull us away. And so Elijah, in this particular story, him and this widow, they have to trust God and not put trust in the other gods. And they do it. And they're able to receive the provision of the Lord. And what I find to be very interesting is that they do it day after day. It's, 
it's not just they did it one time and then that was it. They did it day after day. This is so important. You got to hear this. In the story of Elisha, his protege, what happens is that he meets someone just like this particular widow who is in debt and in a desperate situation is getting ready to have her son taken away from her. And so Elisha tells him, hey, fill up, tells her, fill up these jars of oil. And, and it's an abundance of oil that comes out, and she's able to take it all and sell it. And, and honestly, she kind of makes out as someone not only have her, her needs met, but she has an abundance and is, and is rich from it. But that's not the case for the story. What's happening, you got to see this, is that every time she uses the flour, every time she uses the water, each day she uses it, it gets replenished, but just enough for the next day. Not enough for the week, but enough for the next day. Every day they're having to believe God. Okay, here it is. Flour used, enough for us, it's replenished. Next day, flour used, enough for us, replenished. Sometimes we have to just have faith for the day. Some of us are finding that we're having faith for the day. Maybe it's it's. The, the particular situation that we're facing with our health. And it's like, I, I need to have faith just for the next day, just for what God's doing right now and what he'll do the next day. And it's not about the next week. Maybe it, it, it's a transition we're facing as a, a college student. Maybe it's a student that we're transitioning into college. Maybe it's a new job that has, has basically has started or a job that's come to an end. Maybe it's, it's a new season in our lives where it's, it's like we're becoming empty nesters or there's some type of shift in our lives where something has ended, whatever it may be, but we're having to have faith for the next day and for that thing to happen. And maybe it's God calling us to have faith even when we don't see the results immediately. See, this is the nature of faith is we're putting our trust in the invisible God and his invisible kingdom at work. And we're saying, God, I believe that you will provide a way for me. You will make a way out of no way in my life. I remember during the pandemic, my wife and I reached this particular point because of all of these bills kind of piling up on us from windows being broken and car things happening, all that. And it was, it was March of 2020. Anybody remember that? I think we all remember. And we just finished paying out all these bills. We had almost nothing, you know, in our, in our, in our account. We literally maybe had $50 to our name. And I remember thinking, how in the world are we going to do this? And then, of course, the pandemic happens. And I'm like, I have no idea what's going to happen with our church, what's going to take place. We both look at each other. We are in trouble here. We need God to do something. We need him to provide. And God gave me this word. I went and got divine instruction from God, right, receiving divine instruction. And he said to me, you'll be fruitful in famine, Genesis 26, 11. He said, you'll be, you'll be fruitful in famine. I said, okay, what does that mean? He said, what I want you to do is take a seed, a financial seed, a gift, sacrifice it to me, give it, sow it. And so my wife and I, we decided to pray, okay, what is, what is this seed? We both felt like God was saying $200. <laughs> it was funny because we didn't even have 200. We had 50. <laughs> so we were like, where are we getting this 200 from? Why are we getting 200? It doesn't make sense. 200? We only have 50. And so we just say, you know what? God gives you bread for eating, seed for sowing. So we're asking now, God, will you please give us this seed that we can sow? And I kid you not, this is what happened. Within 24 hours, someone cash-apped us $200. Exactly. 
Just said, I really felt like God wanted me to give this to you. So literally, we take the whole 200 because we don't have any other money left. We take it and we give it to God. Doesn't make sense. But see, here we're following God's divine instructions and his plan. And God did what he did for, what he did for us was a, a miraculous. One thing after another started to happen and line up. We didn't know how it was going to happen. But by the end of the year, we ended up just like Isaac did in Genesis 26. It said he sold during a time of famine, during a time of drought, and God multiplied a hundred times what he had sown. And we received a hundred times over the course of that year of what we had sown. God replenished the whole thing, just like he did for the widow, just like he did for Elijah. He provided for us when we followed his instructions and his plan that he had for us. I don't know where you are today. What brook has dried up for you? Is it dealing with your health? Is it dealing with your education? Maybe it's the concern about the future. Your future was looking at a a certain way, but all of a sudden something has happened, and now there's a need to pivot. What is it for you? Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe something has happened that requires you to move into a new season. Whatever it may be, I want to tell you this. You can be confident that this God, Yahweh, will provide. He will make a way. He will make a way for you, just like he did for Elijah just like he did for the widow. And when he makes a way for you, it's not just for you, but it's also for those he wants to reach through you. This reminds me so much of the gospel. Here you have a widow who's in a desperate situation. And why is she in that situation? Because of sin and because of idolatry. But God sends his messenger to her. And when the messenger is sent, there's a way that's made for her to have life. And that's what we see in the gospel. Is God sent his ultimate messenger to us, Jesus Christ. Jesus is literally the word of God. He is the word made flesh. He's the word that came to dwell with us. And he showed us the way by living a perfect life. But then he died a death on our behalf. That death was because of our sin and our idolatry. It was because we rebel against God and because we have wronged others in our lives. But after three days, he rose from the dead. And that proved that he had power over sin and that our sins can be forgiven. And that we can enter into a relationship with him for all eternity. And here's the thing about it. If God has ultimately made a way for us through Jesus, then will he not make a way for you in whatever circumstance and situation you're facing in your life? He's a way maker. Some of you need to hear this today. That God is at work. There's provision that he already has for you. And today, if you don't know him, there's provision that he's already made for you to know him through Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, I thank you for each and every single person here. I believe that you're moving. You're moving right now. Some of you... that the brook that was previously there for you was a brook where you felt healthy. You felt emotionally healthy. You felt that you were psychologically healthy, but there's been some things that have impacted your life and your soul. And I see in particular there have been some wrongs that have been done to you through other people. And it's had you stuck reminiscing on the way things were before. 
But God has come today to bring freedom in your life so that you would no longer be stuck. For some of you, I see you dealing with the regret of a decision that was made. And I want you to know that God is a God who makes a way even when there has been a bad decision that has been made. And he will not count it against you if you come to him and you follow him. You heed his instruction today. God's going to bring you to a greater level of peace in your life. And he's going to give you hope. I see God allowing hope to spring in your life. There's someone in here that problems in your heart, like physical heart, the way it's been beating has been off. And there's been a great concern. There's even been a medical diagnosis. And I sense the Spirit of God coming to touch you and to heal you. There's someone in here, you've had difficulty with, with having children. That the Lord is going to come and he is going to touch you supernaturally, miraculously. Because he is the God that makes a way out of he is the God that can recreate and transform things. God is calling you in this particular moment to look to him, not to the brook that's dried up. For you to pivot by hearing his instructions. If you're one of those people, you say, I need clarity in this season. As I move into a new season, I want you to raise your hand. The Lord is going to speak to you. He's going to meet you right where you are. Yes, thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I've sensed there's, there's marriage that's, that's really been in a rocky place, but the Lord is wanting to bring you into a place of stability that you won't be rocky, but you'll be on the rock of Jesus Christ. Lord, all over this place and those who are with us online right now, I believe your Holy Spirit is moving. Lord, touch the physical issues that we've spoken about and those that have, have not even uh, voiced their concerns or voiced their particular issues. They've just said, I'm just going to be stuck here at this dried up brook. Lord, I'm asking that the power of your Holy Spirit would move now. Lord, touch them. Lord, thank you for bringing your healing power, your gift to bear in their lives. Thank you, Father, for clarity. Lord, you said... Your word brings light. I'm asking that light would shine, that wisdom would come, that clarity would, would happen in their hearts and they would have direction from you. And Lord, I'm praying right now in the name of Jesus that the marriages, Lord, we would experience a turnaround as they receive your divine instruction. Lord, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would open the wombs, Lord God, of those who have been barren. Lord, I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ, that those who have reached a transition in their education with their jobs, Lord, that you'd make provision and make a way. Spirit of God, we thank you for moving even now. In Jesus.